with that, we're ready to jump into broadband business models. And um, Justin Hallsgrove from Mason QD3 is going to be kicking it off for us. We're also going to be hearing from Bruce McDougall from the city of Anacortes, Kara Rebold from the Port of Whitman, and Bob Shane from Chelan PUD. So if you don't mind, Justin, I will hand the reins to you. All right, can you see my screen okay? Yes, we're seeing your, there it is, perfect. Right, you're getting my presentation here. Your presentation, we got okay, it. Okay, perfect, excellent. Uh, well, um, I'm Justin Holsgrove from Mason PUD3. I'm the Director of Engineering and Utility Services. So I oversee our electrical engineering, telecom engineering, uh, conservation and IS teams here at the district. Um, we also have Mike Grinches, who's our telecommunications manager online as well. So um, between the two of us, we're happy to answer any questions you might have um, as, as we go through this. Uh, so we have a system called Fiber Hoods. Uh, that's what we do uh, as far as the broadband side of the house goes. And that's what we're here to talk about, broadband business models. But PUD's fiber, net Mason PUD3's fiber network uh, it's, is much more than just a broadband network for our customers. Uh, it was started in 2000, um, and it primarily exists to serve our electric operations. And that's an important distinction because, uh, excuse me, uh, because it is here, number one, to connect our um, substations, our offices, uh, reclosers, regulators, uh, equipment in the field for um, SCADA purposes, uh, our radio network and our meter reading network, uh, and other operational functions on our network. That is the primary purpose of our fiber network. However, um, as broadband has come become much, much more important, as we all know, uh, we have been able to utilize uh, the fiber network to create an open access network. We have a partnership with uh, retail service providers where we are wholesale only to them and then they provide retail uh, services to customers within Mason County. Uh, we've been doing it since the beginning um, and I think it's been very successful. So our model is called Fiber Hoods. How do we go from our fiber network which is countywide to the home and who pays for that? And that's kind of how that's how our Fiber Hood program was developed. So the way that it works is Mason QD3 predefines fiber hoods. We identify where the scope and scale of the zone is. And that's a really key piece. Um, we look at um, areas that are unserved or underserved. We look at areas that are near the existing fiber network. And then we also look to see if we have a path to bring fiber to those homes, whether it's uh, overhead, um, which is, is a little easier, uh, or if there's conduit available. Um, and then we have customers do a sign-up process, and once 75% of the customers within the fiber hood, uh, that's active electric customers in the fiber hood, meet the 75% commitment level, um, and they say that they're going to build, um, that they'll take service if we build it, then we put them on the construction list. Uh, so that's kind of quick in a nutshell. If you go to pud3.org slash is fiber here, uh, you'll see a website, and this is what we use to manage our sign-up. Um, a sign up program. We use a, a, a system uh, from COS Systems, and uh, basically it has a, a great sign up uh, process. Uh, you can see how we have defined in the box the fiber hood zone. Um, only predefined zones are able to do the sign up process. Um, that helps us limit um, our abilities to actually respond positively to customers that are interested. And so you can see this is the Boyer Road fiber hood. They're first out of the list. There's a little bit of a gamification going on there. Um, and they are at 66% out of 75% and they only need one more to qualify. So these folks are nice and close and they're very excited. So the big question in the business model is how is a fiber hood paid for? Well, the way that we do it is, um, as I mentioned earlier, we have an open access network where we wholesale um, transport to a retail service provider. Retail service provider has a billing relationship with the customer at Mason PUD3. You can get unlimited symmetrical uh, gig, thousand down, thousand up uh, for anywhere between 60, 65, 70 dollars from our various retail providers. And so that's the, the internet bill that goes to the customer. Well, we have on it what's called a construction adder. And the construction adder is a $25 per month 
pass through from the customers that are within fiber hoods that get connected to the retail provider and then to the PUD because they already have that billing relationship. It works really well. Um, now the construction adder, uh, there's a couple of things that you need to know about that. The construction adder only lasts for 12 years. So let's say we build a fiber hood and a customer connects on day one, they're gonna pay for 12 years, that $25 per month, which recover the cost. At the end of 12 years, the construction adder expires. They don't pay that additional construction adder, they only pay their internet costs. Maybe a customer gets connected on day one, five years later, they move or life happens or they wanna do something different. Well, they no longer pay that construction adder because they don't have active uh, internet service on PUD's fiber. Conversely, if a customer moves in five years later, they only pay seven years of the construction adder. Um, so as I mentioned, it's, it's charged through this retail service provider. And the key is, is that only those who connect, only those who have active um, internet service pay for that construction adder and pay for the construction. This is very similar to uh, melded rate philosophy that we use in the electric side of things. Um, Customers that are at the end of the line, far away from a substation, it actually costs more to serve them electricity than a customer who's right next to the substation, but yet everybody pays uh, the same electric rate. And that's kind of how it works with the fiber hoods. Some fiber hoods are a little bit more expensive. Some are a little bit cheaper. Some connects to the home because we do last mile all the way to the home. Some are a little bit cheaper. Some are a little bit more expensive. But as a melded rate philosophy, um, it, it works out just like the electric system. So we have a question you, come in. Um, for folks who want to join in on a fiber hood late, is there a latecomers fee? No, no, there's no latecomers fee. Um, you still pay the 200, sorry, you still pay the $250 uh, application fee, um, which is the kind of initial connect fee. That's where we do that paperwork of granting easements and, and approving the connection. Um, it's sort of the stake in the game, if you will. And then um, they pay the construction adder once their service gets turned up. And as I said, if they come in late and only get service for the last seven years of the 12 year, they only pay that construction adder for those last seven years. And then uh, after that, once the adder has expired for the whole fiber hood zone, um, then nobody's paying that construction adder. But what they didn't get is the great internet service for the first um, part that they were- Five years. Waiting. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So it's directly connected to receiving service off the network. Absolutely. And that's a really key okay. piece because it ensures that only those who are taking service are paying for that construction of the service. Not all customers uh, in the whole district and not all customers in the fiberhood if you're not interested in taking service. Okay. That's um, great. Thank you so much. Yeah. So that's basically it. Our construction pipeline is full. We're very, very active in construction through Fiberhoods Curb. We have a reconnect grant. However, everybody still wants PUD fiber. And so we're working towards that. And as we work through our pipeline, we're refilling with uh, new fiber hoods that are meeting their goals. And uh, we are gonna be busy building fiber to the unserved and underserved for many years to come. Happy to answer any questions that might come up later as well. So awesome. is the, the total cost per month, including the construction adder, is that that 60 to $70 number you were talking about? So um, let's just use uh, a $60 per month, uh, which is what we see very common for our gigabit uh, broadband service through our retails, retail service providers. The 25 is on top of it. And so in Mason PUD3, if you're in a fiber hood, you can expect to pay $85 per month for that gigabit um, service. And do you know what the um, comparable cost of service is for folks who um, are not on the Mesa network in the area? Yeah, absolutely. Um, especially in these rural areas, uh, we see people having uh, multiple different options and systems to try to uh, fumble their way through internet access these days. It's very common to see a, a CenturyLink or a DSL type of a system. Um, so they've got a bill on that. 40 bucks a month usually is what we see for that. And then you add on um, uh, internet, uh, sorry, through satellite. And some people have two satellite systems so that they can ensure that when their data caps come in, uh, they can kick over to their second system. And uh, we hear stories of people paying $500, $600 a month just to try to get through on poor internet. Um, wow. I saw somebody else in a chat who, who mentioned uh, $130 is what they're paying for uh, gig internet in Union. 
So um, it's $85 in a fiber hood, or if you're not in a fiber hood, um, you know, one of our legacy areas, uh, then you're looking at 60 to 65. Okay, great. And then we had another question. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how you fund the construction? Um, do you bond against the $25 a month adder? No, we don't. Uh, that is a, I guess you could say that that's a risk that the district takes on um, because we have a cost recovery model. So we're recovering those costs over 12 years as opposed to uh, paying that upfront. Um, and the, the way, the reason that that works is because we are predefining fiberhood areas. We're only building to areas that we know are good projects that are unserved and underserved. It's not like we're building to areas that has, um, you know, a, a, a Comcast available, for example. We're not building to Comcast because the customers are probably pretty happy with Comcast. They may or may not be, but there's less of a, a likely chance that they'll connect to the PUD fiber and then we're not doing our cost recovery. So it's really important in the fiberhood model to predefine areas and go where you're needed, go where you're wanted. And then that 75% um, kind of raising your hand uh, ensures we get that. Um, take rate is a really common question and, and uh, um, you know, thing that we talk about here. And our fiber hoods are at about a 50% take rate within just the first couple of months. And I think that you're probably uh, gonna be hard pressed to find that in a lot of other areas. And I think that's because we predefine where we go. We go where we're really, really wanted. We go where they don't have other service available. And has that proved to be a, a good thing, right? Are you having good retention? Once people do sign up, they, they stick with you? Or? Oh, absolutely. We hardly ever have people disconnecting. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's fantastic. All right. We have another question. Um, when you say the construction pipeline is full, what is the limiting factor? What would allow you to run fiber to more fiber heads? We have hired more staff uh, lately um, to, to try to keep up with this demand and everybody is fully tapped, fully tasked and, uh, and just running around like crazy here um, trying to get projects built as quickly as possible. Um, from our line crews to our um, communications technicians, fiber splicers, to our engineers uh, and everybody in between. Um, so we are at, that's, that's what I mean by construction pipeline is full. There are plenty of good projects that are in our pipeline, but we are now looking at, gosh, new projects that meet their goals. We're saying, you know, two years, we're going to get to start designing them. It's kind of where we're at. Not because we're not doing anything, but because we're fully booked through that time. Okay. So I think the question is, what do we need to do more? More money to hire more staff. <laughs> <laughs> and, and now's a tough time for staffing. I think across the state, there are a lot of job openings in the broadband industry right now. Um, and just not enough employees even to hire. We're very thankful to have some excellent people here at, at uh, Mason PD3. And um, so we're really thankful for that. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay, a couple more questions here and then, and then we'll have to move um, on to the next panelist. Do you have a worst case scenario financial plan? What if subscription drops between 50, or 50 to 75% for an extended period of time? Yeah, um, good question. Um, so our model is built on a 35% um, signup rate. Just in case we don't get that 50 to 75%, it works on a 35% rate. It slows our cost recovery down. You know, now we're stretching in the 12 years and we're, we're starting to see some of those more expensive projects take longer than our desired 12 year payback. Um, however, it does work at 35%. When we do that um, sign up process up to 75%, uh, you know, that's, that's a, hard, a high bar to reach. It's been reachable, um, but it does take some um, community organizing. One thing to mention about our sign-up process is that we don't require customers to pay for the sign-up or, you know, sign in blood. They're going to take service. Um, it's, it's a free hand-raising um, deal. Really, it's as hard as creating an account, um, a free account on the, uh, you know, the COS system that we use. Okay, great. Um, and then for your providers that are using your network, do you have um, someone providing a triple play type service? Yeah, we had two providers that were providing TV as well as internet and phone. Uh, we are now down to one that is doing that. Uh, I think the other one noticed that uh, customers were using platforms such as YouTube TV or Hulu or, or whatnot. Uh, so we do have somebody who is providing that uh, digital TV, um, internet and phone as well, but just one. Okay, good deal. And then one last question and we're gonna move to um, the city of Anacortes. So who funds the initial initial capital to build the network once you have 75% of people signed up? 
Good question. So the PUD has a special account that is for fiber hoods that had uh, funds set aside that we were building from and the fiber hood construction adder and those fiber hood fees go to replenish that uh, capital construction account. Perfect. Thank you so much, Justin. It's always interesting to hear Mason's model. It's very dynamic. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, if you have any other questions, you can feel free to reach out to me at PUD3. Fantastic. All right. And now we're going to hear from Bruce McDougall, who is a commissioner with the city of Anacortes. And they have interesting things going on there as well. So welcome, Bruce. Thanks, Claire. <clears throat> Hi, folks. I'm pulling up a... <clears throat> Uh-oh. It's asking me to look to approve Zoom in my system preferences. Sorry. <clears throat> All these Zoom updates, man, they get us all. I may have to ask you to, to share. Oh, here we go. There we go. Is it up? It is up. We're seeing right, the previous screen right now. Um, Sorry? We can see your slides on the left. It's not quite in present mode yet, it looks like. Okay. There now? we go. Perfect, Great. thanks so much. Okay. All right, thanks, Claire. Uh, my name is Bruce McDougall. I'm on the Anacortes City Council. Um, I also work, I've worked as a network engineer for my entire career and uh, I work for Cisco Systems for the last 10 years. So, um, <clears throat> Fiber optic technology and internet access is uh, kind of, you know, it's been my career. So city council is something I've done as a kind of a side project or just, you know, community service the last few years. So what we've done, we started this conversation in about 2015. So we're kind of later to, certainly later to the game than the PUDs. And we looked at it as we wanted to build a fiber optic network as, as something to essentially offer like a really valuable service um, and great customer support to our community. <clears throat> These like kind of key goals. We want, wanted the network to be able to take, you know, have the ability to control our own digital future as a community. And <clears throat> similar to, to Mason, like needing a path to return on investments, you know, this construction project that we need to pay for targeting similar like a 12, 13 year sort of return on investment. And we actually looked at it as like, <clears throat> what happens after the network is paid for? And this is like a, potentially a source of revenue for the city itself. So that became one of the key goals as well. So then, <clears throat> you know, starting in 2015, 16, as we were in these initial conversations working on like what business model should we pursue to achieve these, these goals? Um, so as part of that, like we kind of really had frank discussions about what actually this meant, you know, what is a community owned broadband network itself. And fundamentally, when it comes down to it, it's, it's a big construction project. That's the vast majority of at least the first couple of years. And that's the, the big capital, um, investment and coming from network engineering background. And even I like working for ISPs prior to Cisco, <clears throat> like I was actually really, I'm pretty familiar with the technology and, you know, when you kind of, when convincing or working with like stakeholders, elected staff that are not necessarily, you know, in the ISP business, it's, it, it was kind of a confidence building effort to convince folks, hey, it's a big construction project. It only involves actually some technology, a um, <clears throat> couple routers, couple GPON systems, stuff like that. It's really primarily like this passive um, equipment, the fiber out in the, in the field. So construction, some, some technology, and then ongoing operations and customer support. Like that's the, that's the whole thing there. It's, it's a little bit of an oversimplification, but fundamentally that's what the community owned broadband network came down to it. And so through those discussions, it's like, all right, we, we build confidence, we can do this. We actually, do we need to be daunted by the technology? <clears throat> so Anacortes runs, we have our own water utility as well. And so one of the, one of the confidence building measures that kind of we undertook, you know, working to, to help people get comfortable with this was we've got this $60 million water treatment plant and there's a great deal of technology in that water treatment plant versus 
basically, let's say if we were to become our own ISP, we would need to manage and maintain a couple routers, <clears throat> some GPON systems, and then some stuff out in the field, but not very much. It's actually not very daunting. So then <clears throat> what services to offer? And this is, you know, we've, <clears throat> this is where we've kind of started to differ, started moving away from where, like I said, we're later, we're later in the game. So we actually got to think about, do we want to do open access versus potentially other models? And <clears throat> we looked at essentially the value shift within the industry. This is in 2017 and 18, as we're kind of figuring out what our <clears throat> business model, like what services to offer. And, you know, you've had kind of 20 years of <clears throat> sort of the, the classic internet broadband bundle of internet, TV, and phone. But the last three, four, five years, <clears throat> um, there's been a great deal of cord cutting, not only in the in the phone world, but also, you know, as, as Justin mentioned, like the shift in TV to online services like YouTube and Hulu. <clears throat> So fundamentally, broadband 2.0 is just internet, and then everything is over the top. And so we that, we settled upon that. We would just offer internet service, and then we refer customers or to, you know, if they need TV, if they need phone, we can we have all sorts of services online that you know streaming services or or services like um, oh, <clears throat> Skype or, or or even Zoom, you know, that folks can use to communicate. So that made things simpler. You know, the technology is not that big a deal, uh, relatively speaking. Uh, the service bundle is also really pretty simple if it's internet only. So <clears throat> that actually led us to this fairly simple business model to, to achieve our goals, which is, you know, to achieve the first two goals, truly valuable service with great customer support and the control of our digital future. That was, that meant that's, build it out to the entire city, <clears throat> full fiber to the home, fiber to the prem, to every address in town, and not just like kind of a business core <clears throat> kind of thing. And we're at the point where we're nearly, our service area is about 50% of town now, as we've been in construction for about two years. Um, <clears throat> and we hope to have full coverage by the end of 2023. Again, offering in internet only 100 megabit, <clears throat> gigabit service. And our prices are 39 a month for 100 meg and 69 a month for the gigabit service. Now we also decided we didn't, because it's internet only, we don't really need to do open access and have kind of different ISPs competing. That third goal was fastest path to return on investment. And we were not prevented from being a retail service provider. So we simply became kind of an in-house ISP. We built a small staff and are the retail provider. You actually get your internet bill um, at, <clears throat> on the same bill as your water bill from us. And so the final challenge that we had to actually overcome was, you know, we're, we're still a small town. We didn't want to really staff up to offer 24 seven monitoring and support. And that's where actually NoahNet stepped in. So we we're able to partner with NoahNet. They're able to, they provide 24 seven network monitoring, basically knock services, as well as like after hours um, call center services. And it's been a terrific partnership because that's the place where, <clears throat> you know, where we weren't able to, to operationally scale and NoahNet offers that scale. So that's really the, the summary of uh, Access Anacortis Fiber Optic Internet. If I can take any questions. Bruce, I'm curious, how many staff uh, did the city bring on to run this? We've got a, a department manager, a network engineer, uh, outside plant manager, a kind of a business manager, marketing, sales, and then two construction crews or, you know, installation crews of three each. Um, okay. Once the construction project is done, though, I expect most of that construction crews to be reabsorbed back into public works, like doing other stuff, like water, stuff like that. So it'll, it'll scale back once we're all fully built out. So you're able right now to be deploying at a rate of 50% of the city in two years with 10 staff members. Yes, <clears throat> most of them doing installation, like <clears throat> construction. Yeah. Right, that's very impressive. Okay, we have a few questions coming in. Um, oh, some <laughs> Drew asked the same question as me. All right, so um, same question for the ISP who sticks around after construction. So it sounds like those four employees you'll plan to keep on staff mm -hmm. and the six will be reabsorbed. Yeah. All right. Can this, is the, since our concept of, is the city planning on expanding housing? 
Um, we've <clears throat> We've actually, I mean, it's not necessarily related to the ISP work, but we've recently passed a huge revision to our development regulations where we put in a number of features in there to encourage like <clears throat> housing density and like multi-tenant um, units. So, and we've seen a big uptick in non-single family housing development in the last basically year and a half. So that's meant, yeah, you know, we're, we're trying to become more dense and ideally less expensive or at least, you know, less expensive options. And then, you know, that's more addresses for our internet service as well. Oh, and by the way, we're at about 40, 40 to 42% market share in our <clears throat> kind of original neighborhoods and those are growing. And our target for all neighborhoods is 35%. So similar to the PUD. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And where did the initial funding for this project come from? Mm -hmm. We decided, and this was actually through help with, you know, from NoahNet and the Coast software as well. We decided to build out three kind of trial zones of about a thousand addresses total. And we lent ourselves essentially startup money from, um, <clears throat> from a surplus general fund that we had. So it was a $3 million loan to get started. We figured, you know, if we, <clears throat> if we got up to 30, 35% market share, then we felt like we could go forward with additional projects and additional funding. But if we didn't reach that, you know, we were basically, that was our, our investment we were willing to risk was that, uh, that internal loan to ourselves that we're still going to be paying back. Perfect. And is there a connection fee when you go to connect homes? Yeah, there's a hundred dollar kind of hookup fee. <clears throat> so okay. asking customers to put a little bit of skin in the game. I mean, obviously installation, you know, the, the cost per um, installation is more than a hundred dollars, but uh, yeah, that's, that's the hookup fee. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you so much. That was really interesting. And Anacortes was the first city to become their own ISP in Washington. Am I right? Mm -hmm. We were. Yeah. Very cool. Congratulations. It's yeah, different than anything that has been done before. And there have been a lot of different models in Washington state. So even coming late to the game, you have forged the way for others. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. So next up, we have Kara Rebold from the Port of Whitman to share what they have going on, which is different from both of these models. Hi, Kara. Glad to have you with us. Uh, thank you. Let me pull this up here. Um, yeah, so the ports model is a, an open access uh, dark fiber broadband model, and it relies heavily on the private sector to do all of the lighting and provision of services and all of those customer pieces that um, Bruce and Justin talked about. Uh, let's see. Here we go. Sorry. There we go. So uh, the model was kind of pioneered by the Port of Whitman County, that's uh, who I work for, and started in 2009 when the port was a sub-recipient for VTOP funds. And those funds allowed us to build a backbone um, from the U.S. Bank building in Spokane, which is a co-location facility where multiple carriers are located on different floors, including NOANET. Uh, all the way down to Clarkston, Washington, where there is another co-location facility there. And uh, Noah Nets Fiber takes off from that facility and heads through Pomeroy, which we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about more later and onto Walla Walla. Um, and then along that path, there were additional co-location facilities put in Oaksdale and Pullman has a hut. And now there's also one in Garfield, as well as a facility in Colfax, Washington. So this, this has led to, at this point, about 300 miles of dark fiber along this path and branching out in these um, communities. For example, in Pullman, there's about 14 different carriers that utilize the port's dark fiber to serve everything from cell towers to hospitals, of course, the two universities, as well as businesses uh, within the community. And we, we are, um, pride ourselves on the open access network in this free trade environment that it's caused because it allows all of those businesses um, in these communities to choose a provider that meets their 
um, pricing level, as well as their service level demands. And it also provides them options for redundancy. So um, as you'd expect, the anchor institutions, the large universities, um, the really large businesses have multiple providers using this dark fiber to deliver services into their institutions and they don't have to pay um, multiple construction fees for that. So uh, this is the inside of one of our co-location facilities, just to kind of give you a visual of how it works, all of these different carriers in there together. So um, not by name, but we have a regional CLEC in this one, uh, the local ILEC, as well as local ISPs. And you can see the lease uh, rack space, the cabinet space in these facilities and pay for power. They are all monitored by um, NOANET. They provide network operations center monitoring 24-7, uh, which uh, similar to what Bruce has said too, that's really helpful to our operations. It helps us keep it really lean. There's um, me and one other person. We've, we've grown enough that um, we have two people that manage this whole system in addition to others um, that we have in our locals with. So having the access to that 24 seven knock really um, makes it a reliable system for all of these carriers. We have contracts in place so that we can um, do any sort of emergency restoration and have someone on the ground there within four hours or less and, and solve any issues that are there between contractors for construction and, and splicing. And the ports fiber in these different areas uh, terminates into a distribution panel and then the different companies uh, run their own jumpers to their own equipment and um, provide services there. So once that backbone was built, how did the system grow out in these uh, areas? They came all completely from pri uh, private sector interests. So these different companies would contact me with a request for a quote for service to a certain location. Uh, we come up with a construction estimate. The port has the ability to take a seven to 10 year or longer ROI. And so the, we come back with a non-recurring charge that's a fraction of those construction costs and then a monthly recurring charge. Um, in Whitman County, those fees have been uh, really predictable of two cents a foot within the city limits. And then the backbone fiber is um, $15.84 a mile. So um, sticking the backbone really close to a, an industry standard pricing right there and keeping it so that potentially all of these providers, once they've worked with our system a little bit, they know ahead of time mostly what those quotes are gonna be, which allows their salespeople to really um, target their customer base. If they're successful in the sale, again, an email to me says, you know, we'd like to order this and they sign a service order summary. We have a master lease agreement that has all the pages and all of the attorney language uh, one time, and then it's this ongoing living document of a service order summary. So that makes it quick and easy for them to get um, another location hooked up. And then we do the construction and provide fiber assignments. Um, and then usually we don't hear from them again. And if anyone is going to disconnect, uh, which it's only been a handful over the 10 years that I've worked on this, uh, the reason I know they're going to disconnect is another ISP contacts me and says, I have a new customer and I say, oh, that's interesting. Thinking like, can't imagine the hair salon needs both of you and I'll get the disconnect order within 30 days. So we've, um, I think there's been one location that they left the fiber system completely and it's because they moved out of the building. But once it's been there, um, the businesses either are happy with their provider or find another provider, but they haven't uh, found a reason yet to leave the fiber. What we observed though, this, this model was going great, but um, it wasn't building out to the homes on its own. <laughs> None of the providers had come up with uh, a solid solution for that. And in some locations where there were new developments, uh, they'd work with developers and we had it go a few different ways. One time where they um, wanted us to meet them at a cabinet and the developer had chosen a provider to do all of the fiber through the new development so that they met the port's fiber there. Um, another time we brought it into a facility, uh, the clubhouse, and again, the developer had already built fiber to the home out of the clubhouse. And so that's a provider out of the Midwest that's 
leasing port fiber to get back to one of those co-location facilities to get their backhaul. Um, and, but overall in these five communities where our backbone went through Rosalia, Oaksdale, Tico, Garfield and Palouse, um, there was this huge fiber asset and there were still all of these homes that were not connected. So the port um, looked at doing a fiber to the home project and we applied to CURB for money to do that project. And um, partway through that design piece, uh, Zipley Fiber bought Frontier, who was the ILEC in these communities, and um, showed interest in partnering in this project, showed interest in providing service in these communities. And so through lots of discussions and lots of legal bills, we developed a new model that worked um, with Zipley of an IRU. And so the port money was able to help build fiber to the home in these communities. And the port has an IRU that keeps the fiber in these communities open access for 20 years. And their home runs back to a Zipley CO. And Zipley has um, agreements with the ISPs that want to provide services in these five towns that they can locate in the CO. In fact, there's a caged off portion that's the port side of the CO. And then there's the Zipley side. And all of those homes are terminated and then patched over to the port side so that um, every week I get email addresses of who different providers have signed on as customers and are providing service to. So Zipley's providing fiber to the home on the system as well as five, four or five other ISPs in these five communities. And we had our ribbon cutting last week so you can uh, see some of those ISPs in this picture. And uh, the numbers uh, is pretty new. Rosalia rolled out in August and our last of the five towns, Oaksdale, launches on Monday. Um, but we're getting, we're over a 35% take rate. I say we're approaching probably um, closer to 40 or 50. And that's what I would anticipate by mid next year, we'd be able uh, to say what's happening. With that partnership, we had curb funding. We already had um, county, a million dollars allocated to this. We had port match. We were able to reduce our construction costs because we had a partner in these communities. And so we um, used that surplus of money to build out some fiber extensions. And those are these kind of purple lines that you see here. And those fiber extensions go to transmitter sites, again, owned by ISPs, and um, improve their ability to provide service in the more rural parts of the county where there's not uh, a large population to draw this type of um, fiber to the home type construction right now, and um, improves their service and improves their reach. So we've built those fiber extensions and then are going to be able to do drops to the homes that are just right along them because uh, there's nothing more painful than using a DSL copper connection when there's a fiber marker at the end of your driveway. <laughs> so those folks uh, won the fiber lottery there. You can see this extension right here, it's connected to nothing. And, and I'm sure uh, all of you after your training yesterday know that that might be problematic. We partnered with our independent telco, um, St. John Cable. And they have fiber uh, that connects to the port system here, you know, near the fairgrounds in Whitman County and comes out and goes through St. John, uh, the town itself, and connects right to the end of this fiber extension. And that company has was one of the first independent telcos to build fiber in all of its uh, exchange area. They are um, allowing us to use six of those strands of dark fiber, which we greatly appreciate, as well as the ISPs, to get um, a pathway to Lamont, which allows uh, service to go into that community. And right now it terminates at a Whitman County uh, emergency tower. There's another um, ISP that has a tower nearby there that's going to use it. And um, this, there's also fiber to all of the anchor institutions in that town as well right now. So there's some fiber options as well as improved wireless options as a result of the partnership with St. John Telephone and our um, funding through uh, the Community Economic Revitalization Board. Let me get tongue twister. Uh, this whole project, you know, obviously the homes 
owners were very excited, businesses were very excited, those extensions um, really affect also our egg community. And so this is a picture of Andrew Nelson. Um, is, he's a genius. And uh, if you ever meet him, it won't take you long to figure it out. But he is using um, this fiber that one of these extensions to be able to work with different companies like Microsoft and um, Azure to do test uh, pilots on his farm property of all different technologies that will improve egg efficiency and um, so many things that honestly, when he talks, I, it's like mind blown. I don't even know what you're talking about, Andrew. Um, but I think, you know, his quote from that morning at the ribbon cutting really speaks to what he's able to do over fiber that never would have happened. And in Whitman County, this is a potential with all of our um, farming community to grow and improve and to be a, a leader in um, our nation of some of these technologies and how they could roll out. So uh, really appreciated his time that day to come out. In some areas, we don't have a Zipley Fiber for partnership. And so we worked with the Porter Garfield. This is down in uh, Pomeroy, Washington. They also applied for curb funding and they built fiber to the home themselves. So um, 700 homes in Pomeroy, Washington, that have fiber built right to them. They have their own individual strand uh, connected back to a co-location facility on the port's property. And, um, this project, it took, it took a year, and this is like the whirlwind of a project, but within a year and two months, they had this completely designed and built. And by June of last year, so about six months after the construction crews left town, 50% of these homes are on the fiber. And the port leases this fiber for $20 a strand per month to, there are three different ISPs that are uh, selling services and competing in this community. And there are two different backhaul providers. One of them is NoNet, and the other one is the ILEX CenturyLink. So five companies participating in this project and homeowners getting um, competitive service. One of the companies advertises on their webpage a uh, gig for $75 a month. So we're seeing some of those West Side pricing that you know Mason PUD and some of the other folks are able to offer in a very rural uh, farming community. Prior to this, like when Diana was applying for this funding, she was asking me to upload her application because she didn't have enough bandwidth to get it onto the site. So, you know, I mean, this was like night and day for this community and uh, the stories that, that we've heard since then, it's, you know, you expect people to talk about the educational benefits and the health benefits, but these are also just real people with real lives. And one of them told me, yeah, I'm now watching this show on Netflix that I've heard my friends in Clarkston talk about for years and I had no idea what they're talking about. And this is just participating in, you know, beyond education, health, economy, just daily life. So um, a successful project here and, and they've now got funding through CURB um, to build and PWB to build out to Pomeroy Fiber the Home. And then they have another um, area northeast of town where they're able to extend fiber. One of the largest businesses in Garfield County is out of town and they um, dye seed ranch. They sell seed internationally and they will now have a fiber connection and a telephone line that works all of the time. And, and that's a big deal for the community and for that business, which is, uh, big contributor to the economy there and jobs. Um, recognizing that this dark fiber model uh, was new and different and not a lot of people were doing it and it required um, kind of a different management style than other other components. There were six courts that formed uh, a municipal LLC called Petrocore Broadband and uh, the company offers management services. So Port of Garfield, they have two employees and they were not quite geared up to um, run a fiber project themselves, uh, even wanting assistance with the grant application. And then once it's built, they um, didn't really need to hire an employee to do it, didn't want to necessarily. And so they worked with Petrocord to kind of 
sub out that management function and still keep 85% uh, of their revenues. So it was kind of a real win for them that at this point, they didn't have enough of a need to hire another full-time person, but they could still benefit from the project. So Petrichor formed, and what we're seeing as a result of all of the state money that's available and all of the broadband need that exists, there are quite a few um, ports, counties, and cities that are uh, working on different um, dark fiber open access projects. So $33 million of the Public Works Board funding that just was awarded at the beginning of this month is going to go towards building similar um, open access projects. These ISPs that have built models around it are able to expand, and we're working with new uh, partners across the state. And I have people contact me uh, at least once a week now that all this money is going around saying, heard there's going to be broadband here. How do, how do we use it? How do we sell services? What's the model? And it's uh, nice that it's something that they can depend on um, without needing to invest in all the infrastructure themselves and can build a business case around. So our tips, I don't have, you know, a lot here, but we've found it's partnerships have been really successful, you know, looking at the area and who's there and how we can solve the problem together with uh, the least amount of money possible to make it stretch farther, but at the same time offer competition and reliability. We've tried to stay predictable in the model so that um, private sector can build a business case around it, but it's really understandable. It's not a moving target for them because what we've found is um, by doing that, they've They've been successful, they've grown, they've added employees. In Pomeroy, they actually put up a storefront, Inland Cellular rented a building to do this. And then uh, as you if, you, if this is something you embark on, plan for future growth. This, all of these models, I bet everybody would say this is, when you, when you build it, just know that it's probably not really the end of the road and building in all of the slack and the capacity uh, for growth into the future, you probably won't regret it. You'll probably use it sooner than you think. So thank you for having me and uh, thanks for letting us share. Yeah, thank you so much, Kara. That was really interesting. Um, I have a few questions, um, but we're really short on time. So I'm gonna ask you for your best 20 second answers to them. <laughs> um, uh, who performs the actual service drop to the end user? In all of these fiber to the home, the Zipply ones and Pomeroy, the ISP does. It's their customer. And so they perform it. The projects provide the materials, the drop cable in the box. Okay. And then the ISP like checks that out and goes, goes and creates the drop. Perfect. Yeah. And then what happens after the 20 year open access period? Is there a plan? There is a plan in that IRU, um, Zipli will take control of that network and then we'll see what they do. Okay. Um, I know these are really big, hard questions for 20 second answers. Um, is there a path forward for the continuation of the business if federal funding dries up? Yes, so the port had that initial BTOP funding and we did get curb funding for that fiber to the home, but all of those other build outs to the businesses like in Pullman came from recurring revenues. So there's a revenue stream that facilitates us being able to continue to grow and build out each year. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your presentation. That was really informative and a different model. So it's wonderful to hear another way to go about this all. Thank you so much. All right, next up, we have Bob Shane from Chelan PUD, who is one of the oldest networks running here um, in the state. Bob, please hey. take it away. Sure, can you hear me okay? I hear you just fine. We're seeing Kara's screen right now though. Kara, maybe we can stop sharing. There we go. So okay. I, I don't have a presentation. Uh, we can get through this pretty quickly. A lot of what I heard is repeatable, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. I will start out with some of the, the drive facts about what we have here. So in Chelan County, we have a, a, a fiber to the home system. Uh, we serve the customers uh, from the head end all the way to the point of presence at the home with fiber. Uh, we own that system. We maintain that system. We operate the system. It is a wholesale access, so we have service providers that actually deliver the content over that system to those customers. They're also responsible for maintaining 
that relationship with the customer in terms of troubleshooting issues they have with the network connectivity, uh, right up to our DMARC point, which is our device at the side of the house, the ONT. And then at that point, we take ownership of it. Uh, we have about a dozen providers on our network uh, offering different levels of service from residential to purely business. The services we offer are uh, the typical internet, uh, gigabit speeds and above if desirable. We have advanced services such as VLANs, uh, carrier class VLANs, uh, dark fiber. Uh, we even have some TDM circuits that we offer over our network for our customers. Uh, customers including the district, so our the PUD itself is a customer to the fiber program and they lease quite a bit of capacity from the fiber program itself. I think the couple of things that I think are really important when you look at de delivering a platform of long term uh, benefit is you need to make sure you have uh, complete support from the executive team of the body that's going to basically back this up. It, it is not a short term investment. There's a there's a high expense, high level of effort to get these systems turned up and operated operating. Uh, so it's really clear you set some uh, clear expectations both up and down uh, the, uh, the, kick, the the chain of command to make sure there's a clear understanding of what it is you're getting into, uh, specifically what the goal is. Are you looking to serve everybody? Are you looking to serve just the unserved? Are you looking to serve um, serve the, uh, the uh, um, non-served? So you have to make those decisions. Here at Chelan County PD, we are building a broadband system to benefit our customer owners, period. So our fiber is, is being advanced to uh, ultimately 85% of the county when we're done with this latest uh, advancement of uh, funding for build out. So we have something called the Public Power Benefit Program where we have additional $27 million to, to move our uh, coverage from 70% to about 85%. Under that particular program, there's no uh, direct cost to the customer owner as part of this. It's the district's um, commitment to provide uh, benefit to our customer owners and so we are now moving our uh, program out to areas that are that were not uh, served in our original first 15 years of fiber build out, if you will. Uh, this is a, a program that started in 16, it's going to complete in 2026, of which we add roughly 10,000 new premises to the to the fiber program. So right now it's under the public power benefit build. We are connecting customers at no cost to them but we are not going to every customer in the county. We recognize the last 10, 15% of the county is simply just prohibitively high to, uh, to build out to. We're, we're talking uh, excess of 10, 15, $20,000 per premises to get these locations. And so knowing that we are also looking at alternative broadband solutions that we might be able to use in those environments such as wireless. So as we advance fiber, we are looking at what other alternative technologies are out there that we could use to serve those remaining 10, 15 percent, which could be uh, wireless. That we're looking at that, and we look at that every five years as the technology changes to see how that's playing out for a, a viable solution. Um, I think another thing that is really important when you look at these uh, programs is the hidden cost and the embedded cost of the fiber build out. Um, it's not inexpensive to bring fiber to the to the home. It's very expensive, but it is a long term solution. At least we believe, believe it is 30, 40, 50 years or longer. Um, obviously, you change out to electronics as you need to to keep up with the bandwidth demands. But we, we do believe the infrastructure is fiber to use for these types of things. But there's a cost to do that, not only in the material cost of building out, but the preparation work to be able to do that, assuming you're attaching to the electrical system. A lot of those poles are not uh, adequately um, set for the load or vertical clearances on NES standards. And so you have to anticipate the cost to replace that. And that can be substantial depending on the age of your infrastructure, where you're going and so forth. Not only the cost of that, but the timing of that. So if you're, if you're limited in resources, it can have an impact on your overall schedule. So these are probably fairly obvious things to think about, but uh, it is something you really need to programmatically put into your plans to anticipate the costs, the resources, the timing, uh, and the impact to the rest of the, your business unit or uh, business entity, the district if it's a, if it's a port or the, uh, a PUD because you are competing for the same resources that they are using to do all the other work that's having to be done. So, you know, contractors, internal resources. Those are all real things you really have to think about because they will have an impact on your ability to meet 
expectations. Uh, switching to expectations, um, if you're building a long-term solution, you need to build it with a carrier class type mentality. At least that's our thought. So you need resiliency and redundancy in your network because customers become very dependent on what you provide them in terms of broadband. And so you need to have a system that um, you minimize uh, impact to customers as a result of fires or winter storms or wind storms or network outages. And we, we work really hard to do that. Uh, that's an added cost that you may not think about when you do your planning for your build out. Uh, it's, and you can manage that risk. I mean, you can do a best effort uh, or you can try to provide some type of SLA. Our basic theory is we don't provide an SLA, but we, we go above and beyond to make sure we have resiliency where we can. So all of our network nodes have DC power backup, redundant HVA systems to keep them up. We have dual paths on our uplinks. We have a lot of built-in technology resiliency to maintain the networks under the, uh, the most strenuous conditions. But we still will have a radial feed out to some customers that the fire will take out and we'll lose customers. We have a, a great team within the district to do restoration. So um, our, our district itself supports this. And so when there is an outage, we have uh, great support from the different entities within the district to make uh, restoration as quickly as possible. Our provider is also a key partner in this, that they're out there trying to restore service to their customers as quickly as possible and once we get power restored or the fiber restored. Uh, that's really important because uh, in Chelan County and most counties, you do have a competition for your broadband service. Uh, we, even though we're open access, we do have uh, the incumbents. We have other providers in the area that are not, their business model doesn't uh, allow them to connect to our network, although we are open access. So they operate separate and apart. So they are competing or they are competition. We try to get a partnership whenever we can, but in reality, it's, it's just not uh, in everybody's best interest to do that. So when you build your system, you do need to build it from a competitive perspective. That is provide the best service you can at the lowest rates that you can with the best service offering. Now, again, those are pretty obvious things, but um, we tend to think that if we build it, they will come. Um, in some cases, that's probably the case, but in many cases, um, only if everything's right. Um, so our take rate is, is roughly 55%. It's growing. Um, will we ever hit 100%? No, because we have incumbents in the area that, that compete with us. And, and we know we just don't have our act completely together. But we are looking to grow that every year to something that uh, is, is better than 55%. Uh, right now, we have 20,000 active customers uh, on our network. We Roughly 77% of the county is covered. Um, I don't know if that relates to the number of premises uh, that we actually pass, but it's, it's somewhere around 30,000 premises that we have a fiber access to. I mentioned earlier, we have the public power benefit bill, which is a no cost um, option for customers to connect to our fiber program or a fiber network. Areas that are outside of the public power benefit, we have the typical line extension uh, policy. So if you are adjacent to our fiber, but you're not a recipient of the public power benefit bill, there is a line extension, ex extension policy that applies. And essentially it says if it's under a thousand feet from our fiber and we have a viable pathway, we'll connect you at no, no construction cost. If it's in excess of that, then uh, there would be a charge to, to provide that, that uh, pathway, whether it's conduit placement or uh, adding a separate pole. And that can be done by the provider or the customer or the PD uh, in, in trying to get that service turned up. Um, we have a fairly large staff, I think. We have roughly eight, nine in the business unit, and then we probably have roughly 12 in the direct construction side of the, the, the business model. And then that obviously ties into the greater utility um, resource where we have procurement, legal, uh, customer account, all those different uh, entities help us be successful. And so when you look at your business model, make sure that you develop really good relationships with those adjacencies because it's, it's extremely important. You will rely on them from time to time. Real estate services, for example, they do a lot of our permit or they do all of our easement and permitting stuff. So that's something that's, we work really hard to develop that relationship because it's just not us. It's, it's a group effort. Uh, the mention of NOANET, we do use NOANET for our NOC services. Um, that's very helpful for us because we get 24 by 7, 365 eyes on our network. Um, and we have a, a great relationship with NOANET in that respect. Um, I think the only thing I'd 
probably mention in addition to that is you really need to be thinking about being adaptive. So this is a changing environment in terms of what services customers are looking for, um, both in applications and in uh, costs. So utility, public utilities aren't known to be super nimble and flexible. And so I think you need to build that into your your planning on how you will address uh, the changing environment so that you can be responsive. I don't have it figured out yet. I'm still working on making that a little more streamlined. But um, again, when you have support from the top, from the executive team and the board, it makes it easier to make those types of adjustments because they recognize the importance and the necessity of that. Um, probably the last thing I'd say is um, for Chelan County, we don't specifically target the unserved or underserved. Our build out under the public power benefit bill basically is to provide an alternative uh, to our customers. And so we will build to an area where there could be an incumbent in that area. What we have found though, is if you looked at what services are provided today by that incumbent, there's no guarantee in five years that that incumbent will provide the service that you need at that time. So we believe our fiber program, maybe today is a match, perhaps, although I, I will tell you it's not, but in theory, it could be a match to what they're providing now. But in five years from now, as the bandwidth requirements go up or expectations, we're right there to provide that service. And so I think we'll start to distance ourselves from any provider that's currently in the area of providing the service that they are due now, whether it be DSL or cable modems. And we've seen that time and time again. Uh, as far as external funding, we are looking at federal and state funding, working state broadband office to see what's available. Those higher cost areas, we certainly would like to serve them with fiber. Uh, so we are we are applying for those where we think it makes sense to uh, capture those funds and build out. But again, collectively, you have to look at your total resources to do the work uh, because you do set expectations. And from our experience, if we tell our customer owners we're coming and we don't, under the time frame we have identified, they have a right and they do express frustration with us for not being there when we said we're gonna be there. So that's something, a lessons learned that we have we picked up years back that although you like to share where you think you're gonna go, what, they, what the customers will often hear is where you're going to go. And if there's a change in plan, it's, it's quite the lift to get that squared away and straightened out. So we don't wanna be secretive, but at the same time, we really don't wanna announce where we're gonna go until we have some confidence that we are doing that. And that's through our annual budget uh, uh, approval process with the board every December. And then we let people know we're going the following year. So that was pretty quick, but I know we're running out of time. So I wanna keep it short and um, uh, feel free to reach out to me at Chelan County PD If you have any further questions, I'd be happy to talk about it. But Clara, I'm going to end right there and see where we want to go. <laughs> that was fantastic and dense, sage advice. Um, just an assurance to everyone watching, we are recording this and it will be available later. I know this entire panel had, had so much great information um, and you'll be able to go back and review it. Bob, I do have one question for you um, and I'm going to ask you for your best 20 second answer to a complicated question. Um, what is your potential use of wireless to reach that last 10, 15% of those really hard to reach folks? Are you looking at 4G LTE, 5G, CBRS? Do you have any ideas of what technology? Yeah, we're, so we're looking at the full suite of solutions. So we're obviously going to use fiber for backhaul. So we don't, we're not really looking at the point to point backhaul radios. We're looking for the point to multi-point radios for that type of service. So we are looking at all the different technologies that would, would meet that need. The challenge we have is those customers that have fiber now, uh, that's the datum, that's the reference point we started for minimal service in the county. So when a customer in the remote area has wireless, they're going to compare it to what their brother or sister has in town. And so we're, we're very sensitive to that because we will hear, well, you're only giving me 150 megabits and my brother's getting gigabit. And so we're a second class citizen. So we, we try to anticipate that. Uh, but there will be a compromise. It, 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 you will get something less than what fiber provides, but you will get something better than you have. And that's that's where we're going to go. But the cost of wireless is not necessarily less expensive if you look at the full cycle cost. So that's something else we're looking at as well. Perfect. Thank you so much again to all of our panelists.